you, but if you are wealthy and you have uh, the right connections, you will never see the inside of the jail. If you are poor and uh, you are practically a minority, you are going to spend a long time in jail. And when you talk to people and you say, can you imagine to be in a jail and and being all the time on threat of being dying by real criminals, people that are like tough criminals. People cannot visualize that. So as I usually say, maybe we should put a few people in jail, like a few politicians in jail, and people don't deserve to be in jail. Yeah. And, and, and show them what's inside of a jail, what's happening when you're in jail. And but I think to transcend anything, it's talk about, it doesn't matter. That mo have you seen that movie called Traffic? Yeah. That movie shows it doesn't matter who you are. Death and drugs and pain and suffering, they don't care who is your political party. It doesn't care who is your daddy and who is your mommy. It doesn't certainly care what is your religion. It affects everybody across the political spectrum. And the truth, even if we think that drug dealers are bad people, in reality, the government will never, ever be able to beat the drug dealers because the market, uh, I talk about the market in our case right now, is way stronger and <coughs> more powerful than the government. You can't stop the market. It's like a natural, it's like a nat nature, right? You can stop nature, you can stack water. The market is the same thing. You can't prevent market forces to work. If you try to stop the market, the market will find a way to go around and find, and find, and find the source of their customers. And I think you have to keep coming back to the people that you want to convince that drug war is about. It's harmful, right? There's a, a, a famous economist called Friedrich Hayek that talk about true and false individualism. He has this line. The line is, we want to reduce the harm that the most people can do to other people. If you want to reduce the harm that drug dealers can do to your children or all the people, you have the government is not the solution. The drug and war puts the strength and the power in drug dealers because they can hide the price, they can uh, alter the quality of the product, and they can make you addicted. And that's what they hurt you. Right? So the government is actually and you can argue, well, you know, they have good intentions, but good intentions do not guarantee good results. That's a key issue, and that should be across the political spectrum. Good intentions do not guarantee good results, at least in the case of war on drugs. Great, and to uh, address the opposite side of this, are there any issues that really just can't be championed by a nonpartisan coalition that um, are very partisan and are always going to be seen in that way? And if so, are they the kind of issues that um, people should try to avoid, to not talk about as much in their work, or is that something, is there room for addressing those as well? I'm sorry, I just need to jump in on the last question. <laughs> um, and I want to push back a little bit on the American notion around uh, equal application of the law. And I just want to say, you know, um, yes, people should have the right to put in their bodies what they want, as long as they're not harming other people, as, they're, as long as they're abiding by the social contract. But, you know, in this country, it is clear that, in, that there are some people who have those inalienable rights, right? And there are other people for whom those rights do not really exist and are only merely, uh, they exist on paper. And so I can't, I, I can't let this uh, pass without talking about the challenge of what it means for an African American to be able to say, well, I deserve to be able to smoke marijuana, right? Versus a, a white person to say, I deserve to smoke marijuana. I mean, it is very different to be able to say that and to be able to exercise and act on that. I mean, you know, Trayvon Martin was murdered last month and he didn't have anything but a bag of Skittles and a soda on him. Right? I mean, this is really the, the world that we live in. And so, you know, it's important to understand that, you know, folks like Senator Sessions from Alabama, who really did help bring crack reform um, to the forefront and 
help it move forward and actually uh, make it happen. It, it was his compromise, quite honestly, that was, um, uh, you know, created the Fair Sentencing Act. But you've got to understand, this is also a man who has said he thought the Klan was okay until he found out they smoked marijuana. Right, so this 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 equivalent application of the law and equal experiences in the criminal justice system, it just doesn't happen. And we have to also be uh, willing to acknowledge that not everyone wants it to happen, um, not just that it doesn't happen. And so I think that the most important thing to do getting to the second question is to make sure that when you are working in, in um, coalitions is that you have different voices represented. So we had in our CREP coalition the voice of Pat Nolan and the Prison Fellowship Ministry who were Christian conservatives but who had done some time for some white collar stuff and they knew what happened? And they got to prison and they were like, oh, MG. It's only black people here for stupid drug offenses, right? Like low level stuff, low hanging fruit, not traffickers, not major, you know, players. And, and so they have been willing to sort of come out and say, you know, we, we're not with you on that legalization stuff, but we are with you on getting bodies out of prison, right? And, and so there are ways, I think, to make sure that the chorus that you bring along with you Right. Even if you can't represent all of the voices in the chorus, that you have those voices in that chorus that can that can do it and bridge those gaps. Did anyone else have anything else that they think is just like a political no-go, or is it like across the board everything can be approached if you're looking at it the right way? Um, I don't know if it's a political. Yeah. I actually say it's not a political issue, but I think it does get into the race thing. I completely agree with the racist history to the drug war, but for me to stand up and try to represent a black man looks disingenuous, and I know that. I support those. I'm gladly part of that chorus, but I'm not going to be able to hit every mark, so I focus on the areas where I will be effective. Veterans, students, they come from similar backgrounds, conservatives, and I'm not a conservative, but I understand where they're coming from. And for me to stand up and try to be like, I am the savior because I know and I recognize all these things, I think comes across as disingenuous, and it's been completely ineffective. In, at least my experience. Great, thanks. And um, I'm assuming that almost everyone in the crowd here today is either a student activist or there's someone who's actually on the ground trying to bring about change. What would be the takeaway message that you give them on how they can uh, use use this dialogue in their own work? Like what 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 tools would you put in their toolbox for how they can talk? <laughs> I think I'd say do do some really good research. Try to find out what the um, elected officials that you're interested in talking to have said about this issue or other related issues. I mean, maybe they haven't said anything about drug policy or the criminal justice system, but maybe they're really involved in um, you know school education, right? And and youth from from the education perspective, but not the juvenile justice. Perspective. I think you just have to be, do, do research to find out where you can honestly connect and educate. And I think it's really important to be honest and to acknowledge who you are in that space, but to also be able to say, there are others who say the same thing. We just get there from different paths. And I think, keep on. Nobody gets their lives in my change with a three minute YouTube video, contrary to what a lot of Ron Paul supporters do. Uh, <laughs> just keep talking to them, keep bringing it up, and try to hit them from all the angles, whether it's education, research, or whatever you think is their passion, come at it from their passion. Yeah, along the same lines, I would say go out of your comfort zone. Don't just talk to people that are similar to you or your friends. Um, try and get all the talking points that you can for all different places, and then go out to talk to people that are different. Great, and I just wanted to take a little time for all of y'all to ask whatever questions may have come up to you. If you could please be really respectful of everyone else's time constraints and not like use this as a forum for your own opinions and just like a quick one or two minute question or one or two sentence question. Well, Aaron said something really powerful. He said, Can you speak up? Yeah, so, so in the last panel, the leadership panel, Aaron said something really important to me. He said that to be able to move a conversation forward, you have to understand the opponent's arguments as well as your own. And so if the science and the statistics and the, there's no good argument for the drug war, 
Can you help me understand why it still exists? Why is it still active? Uh, it's politics, right? So you are catering as a politician your goal. You may have good intentions and you want to help the people, but in the real world, when you're politicians, what you want is to stay in power and to maximize your vote. So you are going to cater to the people preferences. And let's not forget, I know there's a table about uh, drug enforcement against the war on drugs, and I praise them a lot, but if you stop the drug on war, a lot of people are going to say, well, what well, well, the police is going to do? We are not going to have jobs to stop those drug dealers and those prison guards and all those bureaucrats. They are losing their jobs. So that's the problem, is that you have in the political world, it doesn't matter if it's what is true or wrong, what matters is what's going to get me elected. And look, I have, I, I, I'm not, I don't vote because I'm a foreign person. And if I was voting, if I was a citizen, which I intend to be, I would not vote either because I believe voting is inefficient. But that's because I'm an economist. <laughs> but let's be honest. When Barack Obama was elected, I, as an outsider, my brother, I say, Barack Obama, I don't like him, but he's way better than the other guy, the mommy, I call him, because he's about to die. <laughs> But the point is, look, you will think he will at least try to reduce the attack on the war on drugs. Isn't it intensify the war on drugs? It's even worse. And Biden just came on last week or two weeks ago, said the cost of uh, legalization of drugs will be much higher than the cost of the war on drugs. I'm like, why have you been smoking? <laughs> are praising on the ignorance of people. And our most powerful tool is education. Try to educate people and not try to make them vote one one another. Educate, educate, educate. It's easier to educate and inform, provide information to help them. I don't want to make promotion to learn liberty, but those are short videos, three minutes. Diffuse those videos regardless of what are your ideological belief. Because what is a problem when it comes to voting is that people have what we call rational ignorance. It's costly for them to get informed. The worst thing about internet and the web is that you can provide cheap information. Short videos, short little texts will communicate this information to people to have make more. We make the politics will come has to come from the back, the bottom, not from the top. We make more change. Uh, just a quick point on that also. I think some of it is also just evolutionary biology. At some point, you stop changing your mind. You just have grown accustomed to certain traditions, and which is why you see such a huge age disparity when you ask people on the ground. It's because when you get to your 30s, start raising a family, it's just too much effort to worry about facts and changing your mind. Like you just, you focus on your day to day, and that's just kind of how biology works. Like you're made to raise a family. That question right there, that? I just wanted to respond to the I kind of wanted to respond to the last question um, in terms of knowing the um, other side of the opponent's uh, thoughts on an issue, their, their views. Um, honestly, I found that the best way to uh, uh, get someone to listen to you is to actually and truly genuinely listen to them in return, as opposed to just hearing and trying to figure out how you're going to respond. Just let them talk. Let them listen. Because you have your talking points, they have theirs. And they want to have you understand their point of view as well. Great. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to speak to not only the former military, but also the economist. I, you know, got, I, this is my first conference, but my point about um, legalizing was, um, Thomas Jefferson once quoted that uh, any seed that benefits the state should be planted everywhere. And cannabis is one of these seeds. Now, I've also realized to come to understand that a lot of military can't function in normal society anymore after certain instances of trauma and war. But yet, if they go back in, they can still listen. Well, if we legalize marijuana, why not allow the fact that it has over a hundred different uses, maybe possibly under the right circumstances, allow the American government to open up farms and then allow these military workers who can't listen to Joe Blow behind the 7-Eleven gas station to go clean up the bathroom, but they can listen to the three-star general. 
I mean, can't they improve uh, not only boosting the economy by giving work to military vets and also by having the production of not just maybe smoke, you know, smoking marijuana, but also making stuff out of it again? I mean, the first Ford Model T was made out of... So, like, what do you think would be the best way to go about that? Like, to incorporate the two into making jobs for ex-military who can't function and also legalizing marijuana and making products out of it. Well, going to the actual military, I think, is impossible because the military is always 15 years behind everybody, with so whether it's their social views, technology, everything. They're 10 to 15 years behind. But I think a program similar to maybe the GI Bill after World War II, where you provide, and like the Army provides VA house assistant loans for you to start a business or own your own home if you serve military service. A special program that perhaps got veterans involved in that kind of agriculture, I think, of boosted. But first, we have to get the federal government out of the middle of to get really serious and say, no, that's not what it's about. Here's what I'm working for. And then the marijuana culture is fine too, but it's just something different entirely. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, question back. Uh -huh. I have a question for our uh, Thomas fellow over here. Now, I know one of the biggest concerns that people voice about, uh, I know one of the biggest concerns that opponents to uh, reform voice is the loss of jobs, as mentioned earlier, um, especially the you know, one of the biggest voices against it would be the, the privatized prison industry. I mean, they spend billions on lobbyists. But realistically, looking at, at, at the loss of jobs, say we, we lose these prison jobs, we have less people enforcing, you know, um, so they're saying we legalize stuff, we lose jobs. Well, at the same time, just, just like any other supply and demand market out there, um, those, those jobs are going to go somewhere else. You know, those jobs are going to go to cultivating uh, production, um, uh, the entire production supply chain, um, and take that away from the cartels. You think that is going to have a big enough impact to more than offset the initial loss that we would see from that change in policy? Uh, your question is, because people are going to lose jobs if we stop the war on drugs, Will we find opportunities to put them somewhere else? Yeah, or well, let's, jobs well, let's start by the putting them to actually stop them through crimes, right? Yeah. Why don't we start yeah. by yeah. using yeah. cops and make them do the job they're supposed to do, which is to stop real criminals, <coughs> murderer, rapist, whatever you can think about our real crimes, as opposed to stop people that do marijuana. Because let's think about that thing. It's much more difficult to stop a real murderer than it is to stop somebody who does marijuana. Right? It is much more dangerous. So we pay a lot of money for those tax with our taxes. I pay, and I make a lot of money, so I pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> so I pay a lot of money and I want the cops to do their jobs. I don't want cops I don't want cops to stop people for speeding or for doing marijuana. I want people, the cops, to do their job which is to protect property rights and arrest real criminals. Same thing for prison guards. Teach them to become re-educators. I mean, if we believe drugs is bad for you, right, and addiction is bad for you, 
is not a better alternative, which is to educate people about how drugs are bad for you and have uh, uh, rehabilitation programs. And we uh, train those people to become rehabilitation programs. A lot of people talk about the Portugal experience, right? The great debate is Portugal experience where they legalize drugs or decriminalize drugs and transfer all those workers who used to be working trying to stop uh, uh, drug addicts to put them in rehabilitation program. And yes, if you legalize drugs, the supply is going to increase, the price is going to go down, and some of the drugs are going to disappear. Like the low quality bad drugs will disappear, and therefore you will have probably less people harmed as a result of drugs. I just want to make a, I just want to make a clarification point. Um, I, I don't think anybody in this room should be thinking that the mass incarceration, over incarceration, binge that we experience in the United States, uh, you all know we have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. I don't want anyone in this room to think it's because of marijuana and law enforcement. The majority of people who get marijuana um, uh, charges and, are, and convictions are low-level uh, possession arrests. And while there may be a period, a, a jail period involved, they are by and large not going to prisons for long periods of time. Okay, so it would not impact the prison industry. It would probably impact law enforcement, though. And so you know. There, there is some incentivizing that's been done, burn, jag funding, cops funding, to put boots on the street that has you know, increased these um, low-level drug arrests because they are the easier arrests to make. But I also want to make another point, and it's not just that we would need to find other, right, but that politicians actually see the increase in expenditures for prisons as job creation mechanisms, and that is a problem. So this fall, you know, I feel like we've laid the groundwork and we have some agreements, right? Yeah, politicians thought in the, you know, in the Senate and the House that there were too many people in prison, that the crack powder triggers were too low, and that there needed to be significant reform. I have mistakenly made the assumption that we are continuing, that we've already agreed to that, and that we will continue to operate with that baseline. However, that is not the case, though, when it comes to votes, because this fall, the Senate Appropriations Committee, remember the Senate is actually controlled by Democrats. Can you tell them an angry Democrat? <laughs> so they decided to zero out the budget for critical funding, the Second Chance Program, which provides money to states for folks who are coming home from prisons, because you should know most people come home even though they spent a long, long time gone. And so this money goes to making sure that they integrate better with programming, substance abuse, job, job stuff, all of that, right? They zeroed out that critical funding, but wanted to increase the Bureau of Prisons funding, not just for programs and operation costs, but for new construction, to bring new prisons online. New prisons online. And this effort was championed by Senator Durbin, who was the champion of the crack powder reforms. And it's because he had to bring pork back to the state in the form of a prison. And Senator Shaheen from New Hampshire joined him in the fray and said, one of these prisons is going to be cited in New Hampshire, and I am now a job creator for this. So these are the problems that, we're, that we have when we come to market you know, issues. Yeah, let me just quickly say, because I think it's a crucial point that while examples like this exist all the time and the lobbying industries are horrible, it's a complete myth to say that it's all gloom and doom. Every politician, every law enforcement officer, every prison guard is sitting there trying to get the drug war to continue. I talk to police officers and prison guards and people in charge of prisons and police chiefs every day and they hate it. They're like, it's so unfair that my priorities are all out of order and the biggest problem in my community is domestic violence and sexual assault and I can't go after that. So they are waiting for the law to change so they can do that. And I think I saw Eric actually really the um, The panel is about transcending political differences and we've pretty much established that we can do that when we're attacking the status quo. But when we're proposing specific reforms, it seems like political differences can much more easily arise. Uh, look at the internal conflict with Proposition 19 where the medical marijuana industry suddenly says, oh my gosh, our profits are at risk if we legalize marijuana for everybody. 
I'm interested in the panel's thoughts then about how we transcend political <coughs> differences when we're talking about specific concrete reforms which begin to sort of bump up against political philosophies and economic interests. I think it's important to understand when you're setting out new um, new proposals, who is going to benefit from that proposal and who benefits from the existing law, right? And Shalene, Shalene uh, pointed out a very important thing and reminded me actually that we have actually had great success working with the prison guards union. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not the prison guards union, the um, correctional association. Uh, prison guards union, no, not helpful <laughs> at all, at all, sorry. But the cor correctional association, because they feel the, the challenge as she articulated. And so I think it's important to, um, like I said, make sure that those folks are at the table when you're making your proposals so that one voice isn't carrying the day because it can be polarizing and off the line. I think most libertarians will vote for anything that makes things better than it is now. We're also, you know, the 5%, so we don't have a lot of political sway in us at that. Great. Uh, I want to thank all of you on the panel here for joining us today. Um, I want all of you uh, to keep these issues in mind. Maybe tonight as a party, if it comes up, good time to talk to people, uh, to convince them why this isn't like a Democrat issue or a liberal issue, and why we be talking to people across the political spectrum. And since this is diversity uh, type issue, bringing people from across the platform, I want to encourage all of you to come to the diversity meeting tonight at 6.30. That's going to be in a um, a chasm creek a um, and we're just going to be talking about things that the diversity committee has been doing and how all of you can get involved and we'll be going out to dinner afterwards to talk more about these issues thank you